I'm back <laughs> here in Richmond, Virginia. I'm back to share the boon of uh, knowledge and a lot of great stories and experiences to share, as uh, I guess Joseph Campbell would say in the Hero's Journey, Power of Myth. And the stuff I would like to share for the next couple of days is my experience at the Mises Institute, which was an extraordinary time I've had with fellow scholars and professors. And I'm going to start off with the interview I had with the president of the Mises Institute himself, Jeff Dice. Um, so thank you very much for sure. uh, <laughs> putting all this together here um, as uh, the president of the Mises Institute. I think that's uh, that's got to be an awesome job. <laughs> yeah. it, it is. It is an awesome job. It's uh, probably about as good a job as I could hope to have. Uh, so I'm obviously grateful and happy to be here. All right. And uh, then here in the Austrian School of uh, Economics, the, the Mises Institute, what then does uh, Austrian economics mean to you? Well, to me, it means economics demystified. Uh, to me, I'm not even sure that I'm a huge fan of the term Austrian economics because it assumes that there's a particular blend or variety. And it's really just a, a term of convenience. There are some, some great economists uh, who wrote some seminal works. They, ha they all happen to hail from Austria, so hence the term Austrian economics. But what I don't like about the term so much is that it, it's used sometimes to pigeonhole people or to bludgeon people or to assume that anyone who, it, it, who uses that moniker necessarily accepts uh, an alphabet soup of uh, certain theories or preconditions or whatever it might be. And that's not always true. I mean, there are people who uh, accept certain tenets of Austrian economics, but perhaps reject others. So I don't like to see the term used dogmatically, and I don't want to like to see it used uh, in, in the sense of creating some sort of litmus test. Like in order to be an Austrian or to call yourself an Austrian, you have to think X, Y, and Z right. about, about economics. It's Because it's really not, Austrian economics uh, is not a, a particular ideology or anything. It's, it's, a, it's a methodology. And it's a, a set of ways of looking at human action and understanding money and that sort of thing. But I think sometimes that term implies a certain rigidity right. that doesn't do us any favors uh, in terms of outreach and growth. Right. So um, I'm very proud to study what little I have of you know the the great Austrians. You know, it's I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, my job is to run the institute in, from sort of a business side. Right. But uh, obviously, I've, I've read a, a great deal of Austrian economics, and it's, it's, it's motivated me. It's captivated me. I was a, a young libertarian, but I didn't, have, I didn't have that econ foundation to really be an effective advocate. Um, and reading Mises and seeing his, you know, he made a utilitarian argument for laissez-faire, and then later reading Rothbard, who made a natural rights or natural law, uh, defense of laissez-faire really opened my eyes and turned me from sort of a garden variety libertarian uh, into someone who uh, had, was much more of a nar narco-capitalist bent and who understood uh, the state uh, and all of its depredations a lot more clearly right. because of studying econ. Nice, nice. And in terms of like the growth and where the institute is growing, um, how many students uh, in this uh, at Mises University, uh, yeah. From what what kind of uh, places do they come from? Like how many countries? Uh, I think this year we had about 180 total uh, from about 14 or 15 countries. I think 30 odd U.S. states and about 101 colleges. Wow. Yeah. So uh, Austrianism is definitely a, a worldwide phenomenon, and and what we sometimes don't understand in the U.S. We tend to be very U.S. centric, is that interest in free market ideas, interest in people like Mises and I, is growing much faster outside the U.S. than it is inside the U.S. I mean, here we are <laughs> in the United States still, still talking about socialism in 2016 after it's been uh, re refuted time and time again, not only uh, theoretically by great works of, of people like Mises, but also in practice we've seen what, what uh, socialism leads to. But in the rest of the world, the, what we might call the developing world, uh, people are interested in Austrian economics because they're interested in becoming wealthier. Right. They're interested in having better lives and being richer. So uh, there are cities in China, you know, huge cities of 10 million people, but because that's not huge by Chinese standards, we haven't even heard of this city in the U.S., and they'll have a couple of professors, 
who will get in touch with us at their at the the university in this ten million person town, and they say, "Oh, you know, we're doing we're doing translations of Hayek, or we're doing translations <laughs> of Rothbard." And so, um, I think sometimes we get uh, a, a little despondent in the West because we think that we you know we're post everything, and we've got uh, neoconism seems to be ascendant and. And our economies seem to be stalled, and our central banks seem to be out of ammunition and stuck on this this sort of uh, monetary stimulus model. But in in vast parts of the world, there are people sort of waking up and saying, "Hey, you know what? How did the West get rich, and and how can we do it?" So I, I want those people to be able to find Austrian economics and not get sidetracked right. um, with monetarism or supply sideism or anything like that. Yeah, I hear like Brazil has a great uh, growth there uh, occurring there. Signs sure. out there, um, less Marx, more Mises. Yeah. Um, and I met many of yeah. them here uh, coming from Brazil. I think that's amazing. Yeah, well, the, the Mises Institute in Brazil is unbelievable. Uh, a guy named Elio Beltrão uh, has been a huge activist and has done a, a lot of things to make Brazil hotspot for Austrian economics. I mean, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of young people down there who are, uh, who are going to big conferences um, and, and learning this stuff. So it's great to see. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I guess one other question, I guess I have two more left, would be, uh, what do you think of government then and should it be abolished? Y yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I don't like this idea that this is like a, a philosophical dorm room discussion that is okay for young kids, but serious adults have to understand that there's always been government and there's always going to be government. You know, it's a way for non-libertarians to try to marginalize libertarians and say, oh, you know, you guys are talking about this pie in the sky. But I don't come at it that way, you know, when the whole debate over anarchism versus minarchism. My, my view is that um, I think government represents failure because Government is really just warfare by slightly less oppressive means. I mean, go government is violence in jails and prison and police. Um, so it's not quite a state of all-out war, but it's just politics is, is war by other means. You've probably right. heard that expression. So I view the you know government, wherever government exists, that means human beings have failed to deal with one another voluntarily. But that's no different than saying, you know, in, in look, in virtually any society, there's going to be human society, there's going to be certain kinds of diseases. Well, that's probably true, and maybe there always will be, but that doesn't mean that cancer researchers don't say, my goal is to eradicate all cancer. Or uh, a biologist doesn't say, my goal is to eradicate uh, you know, some other disease. You know, that's the goal, and whether or not that's uh, doable in one's lifetime, that doesn't change the goal, no, nor does it change the goal of a criminologist say, I want to eradicate crime from society. People say, oh, come on, there's always going to be rape. There's always going to be murder. Why don't you focus on just preventing work on arson right. or something like that? They say, no, you know, it's a lofty goal, perhaps even unattainable in a sense, but, but you still have to have that goal out there to work towards. And I think if you, if you approach anarchism that way and say, well, of course that's the goal. We may never achieve it. We may not achieve it in our lifetimes, but that's what we're moving towards. Because if you accept minarchism uh, sort of philosophically, then you're backsliding. You're getting into debate over, well, you know, we're going to have a military and then we're going to have government courts. I'm all for private courts. We're going to have government defense. I'm all for private defense. Um, and I think that backsliding history shows <laughs> that, the, um, you know, li limited government is like limited cancer. Right. It, it tends to grow, to grow. So I I don't let anybody pigeonhole me as a utopian. Right. The utopians are people who think that a, a centralized state exactly. can make us better off through force and violence. Th those are the utopians, and, and we're the realists. Right, yeah. We're, no. we're the realists because we know that in every human endeavor, private, voluntary solutions always work better. We're not tr talking about a perfect world. We're talking about a better world. Right. And so I think it's a trap that non-libertarians try to get you and say, oh, are you an anarchist? You just say, well, is it, does a cancer researcher want a world free of cancer? Yeah. Yes, he right. does. Yeah. And it matches with the motto here, uh, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly right. against it. Right. Uh, so then what does uh, free market anarchy mean to you or anarcho-capitalism? Well, to me, it means um, 
markets over power. Uh, Rothbard termed his, called his, well, it was actually going to be part of Man, Economy, and State, but it, it was published separately. He called it Power and Market. Um, this is sort of a take on the old uh, Franz Oppenheimer uh, narrative that there are two ways that people can deal with each other, economic means or, or, or political means. You know, one is, is through voluntary cooperation and exchange in the marketplace, and the other is through force and violence of, of voting and politics and ultimately uh, police. Um, so I think it's, it, it's easy sometimes for libertarians to uh, fall into this way of thinking that there's going to be a third way that technology is going to somehow create right. a new third way of humans that, that, that's going to make the state obsolete. It, it, you know, technology is great in that it makes it harder for the state to govern us, um, like uh, cryptology, for example, or Uber makes it harder for the state to maintain a taxi monopoly. And we should always celebrate that. But technology is, is also a double-edged sword in, in the sense that it's usually available to the state right. to, uh, you know, to spy on us versus surveillance or to you know, fly drones over our houses or, or whatever it might be. So um, I'm wary of what I call third-way libertarianism or fusion libertarianism. To me, no matter how much technology advances, it's always the same old story it's been since biblical times, which is are we going to deal with each other uh, as human beings voluntarily, or are we going to deal with each other um, with bullying and force? Right. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what it comes down to. And and at the and at the one end of that, we're going to deal with each other voluntarily. I, I would, you know, you can term that anarcho-capitalism if you care to. I, I would just term it um, uh, private society or or natural law. Yeah. And is it ever going to exist perfectly? Are there are people going to um, are people going? Would people be better off and healthier and wealthier in a stateless society? No question. Uh, would life be perfect? Would we all be uh, um, brilliant and good-looking and rich and satisfied and and not have any uh, nagging problems in our lives? No. Um, so really, why we need people think we need anarcho-capitalism as as an end. To me, it, it's it's. It's how things ought to be so that we can get on to the real things in life, which is going to our kids' soccer game or learning a foreign language or planting a garden without having to worry all the time about dealing with this monster right. that we call the state and, and the regulations and paying the taxes and all that. So um, I have a, uh, let's just say, I have a, uh, a friendlier, happier vision of what anarcho-capitalism looks like than probably what... Most non-libertarians say, oh my gosh, that's some sort of chaotic state of, of uh, strong men in Somalia right. or, or, or this kind of thing. So uh, I'm, I don't shy away from the term. I think it's accurate. Um, is it the most sellable term? Is it the most from a tactical or an outreach standpoint? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good question because there's a lot of people who don't like the term capitalism, a lot of people who don't like anarcho. And, and uh, for, for older people especially, I mean, if you look at Mises coming from from old, being born into old Europe prior to World War One, uh, anarchy and anarchism was always associated with left-wing radicals, mm -hmm. um, and so it, I think, particularly for him, it carried a taint uh, in his mind, and that's why he was very wary of Rothbard's professed hmm. anarchism. Um, so you know, we do have to understand the power of language, right? But we also um, when we start making compromises, when we start waffling, I think we get into Gary Johnson land. Right. And I think we become um, so watered down as to, as to be meaningless. And, and what, we, what we do know, what Trump and Sanders and even Ron Paul 2012 shows, that, is that people really are sick and tired of the saccharine, empty platitudes that they get. And they really are looking for something that they consider real. Now, you and I might say what Bernie represents is, is bad, but there are a lot of people who think he's real. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's something where, where I think, in terms of how people view the Mises Institute, our, our best selling point, and you can say this about anarcho-capitalism itself, our, our best selling point is actually our intransigence, our unwillingness to compromise. Whereas 
the, the, the Beltway always sees that as a hindrance. Oh my gosh, you guys have to be more flexible. Well, where's that gotten us? Right. Um, there's a huge appeal to, to people who, who, you know, when you lay things out in black and white and you stick to your guns. Um, so I, my argument is different than a lot of libertarians. I, I think that tactically, from, from a long-term uh, tactical perspective, the, the more principled, the more radical one's libertarian is, the, the better chance it has of ultimate success. I believe entirely with that 100%. Never compromise our principles for politics. Let's give that a chance. It's never been done like in centuries. Right. And you guys have done very well for yourself and successfully. And 30th anniversary now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's beautiful. Um, and here in the Rothbard Library, I have one last question then. Sure. Are you an enemy of the state? Um, I, I don't want to be in the sense that you know, on some level, the state, as we think of it, is still made up of human beings. And right. I'd like to think that, um, you know, they're just deeply mis mistaken individuals. Um, when we talk about the state in, in the U.S. sense, we, I think it's very important that we, that we understand Congress and the Supreme Court don't really matter. Um, the state is the U.S. federal government agencies. Um, th that's where the real action is. That's where the real oppression is. They, they aren't really accountable to Congress or to the so-called judicial branch in any meaningful way. 99% uh, of these uh, bureaucratic employees do not come and go when Obama gets elected right. or whoever's going to replace Obama gets elected. They're there like, the, like the, the, the part of the iceberg that you can't see under the water. Um, and they're basically acting um, with no restraint. So what we really have is state anarchy. We have lawless government um, and, and way too much law for the, the people. So we have, when people say like, well, how, you know, how could anarchy ever work? Well, that's what we've got now. We've got a government that can do whatever it wants oh, unchecked. Right. And by government, I mean the, the federal agency. So, um, you know, if, if you, you know, you ask me my enemy of the state, I mean, we can, we can joke about that in a funny way, but let's say you're Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban was targeted by the SEC for some BS insider trading thing. Now, Mark Cuban is a, is a kind of person who can muster up millions of dollars and spend 10 years on lawyers fighting the feds to, to clear his name. And he, he ultimately was victorious. Um, I don't recall offhand if the charges were dropped or if he was actually uh, acquitted in a, in a trial, I, I think they dropped the charges on the eve of trial. I, I, I might be th recalling that incorrectly. But the point is that um, he was targeted by the state and he was powerful enough to fight back because he happens to be wealthy. Um, but for the vast majority of us, right. um, if, a, if a government agency, let's take the IRS, came after us, no matter how outrageous their charge or what they're trying to do is, it's almost in all cases, you know, you're going to just have to deal with them and make a plea bargain in a criminal case or pay them over time in a civil tax case, let's say. Um, suing the government in its own courts right. is, is simply not a, a viable remedy for most people because they have Justice Department lawyers. They have unlimited lawyers. You know, you have to go out and pay a lawyer 400 bucks an hour or whatever. Um, so, you know, even though the state really is, is not powerful, it, it, it can pick out individuals and ruin their lives uh, to the extent that the rest of us become timid sheep right. who, are, who are afraid to stick our noses up. So in that sense, you know, if we all withdrew our consent, the power of the government would, would just evaporate overnight. You know, 3 million uh, federal employees in a country of 320 million would be nothing. Right. Um, but it's their ability to, take, to, to pick that individual and, and uh, destroy his or her life, um, that, which they couldn't do with Mark Cuban, that makes it so scary for people um, to, to become, maybe not an enemy of the state, but a target right. of the state. So, you know, these are the times we live in, but I, look, there's been lots, lots rougher, more dangerous times in American history, just talking about America alone. I mean, there are people who went through, obviously, uh, two horrific world wars, uh, Southeast Asian War, uh, the, uh, the Great Depression, uh, people lived through the horrific Civil War, um, you know, uh, the War of 1812, the British came and sacked the White House and burned it to the ground. And right. today, today uh, that, that's 10 9-11s yeah. all in one, you know. So, um, 
you know, we owe it to ourselves to not be despondent or to think that somehow we're, you know, no matter what situation we're in, our great grandparents had it tougher by far. So who are we to whine and cry? You know, no, we have to be worthy of our ancestors. Right. And that's something that we should think about when we wake up in the morning is, are, are we worthy of our ancestors? And I would hope that our ancestors would look at our current situation with disgust and say, you know, hey, you know, get cracking, do right. something about it. So that's why we're here. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. Right, thank you for being a okay. champion of liberty. All right. Thank you.